Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll. Nice to have you with us today. Our goal is to have every American who wants to, to live a longer and healthier life. Is it doable? You bet. Can we prevent about 90% of all our diseases like cancer and heart disease and stroke and diabetes? Yes, we can. But it means we have to have a commitment. It means we have to have some discipline. It means we have to be able to change. Now there's a lot of motivation to change. So we're going to give you all the tools you need. Starting with a new study out of the Mission Hospital in India, mortality, meaning death, was lowered during a five-year period among adults who supplemented with calcium and vitamin D. Now you think, well, those are easy to obtain. So why are we a nation deficient in them? Simple. Most of the foods that most people eat most of the time is denatured. When you have a plant, a whole plant, something you've grown yourself or you've purchased at a local market. Now, I always prefer you growing them yourself or purchasing the local market because of the time. When I go to the Saturday market here, I'm getting a wide variety of selection, a lot of exotic fruits and vegetables I wouldn't find elsewhere, like dragon fruit it comes in red and yellow and white. And the tastiest is the red, the most nutrient rich is the red because all that redness is giving you a lot of the plant-based chemicals that help protect your immune system. When I'm eating a lot of the whole grains, and keep in mind, I, I share a difference of opinion on some things with a lot of other nutritionists and people in the health field always have. I don't say that I'm right and they're wrong. I simply say that do your homework and see whether Dr. McCullough, who shared a lot of positive information, is very courageous, by the way. I filmed uh, Joseph when I was in San Francisco last. Is that he'll see him in a new video, a new documentary. And uh, while in the hotel uh, where we were both staying, in order to do the filming, I brought people in from all over the state uh, because now it's so difficult to travel and to get into different places. I said, what the heck, I'll just rent a suite, bring all the different 12 people I was going to interview there over the day or two. And Marcola was one. And we talked about all the things that we shared in common. And we share a lot in common. And most importantly, I said, Joe, I really respect the fact that you've not, you've not hesitated to join in to show how much of the official version of everything in our society involving health is wrong, in part or whole. And even though we have a difference on diet, hey, and he mentioned, he mentioned that he met uh, uh, Robert Atkins once, and Atkins was a close friend of mine. I mean, real close. We were personal friends. We went out you know, all the time, had dinner, traveled together to do. Again, I, I respected Robert because we had to take a message of how the FDA was corrupt. This is 1972. And uh, I couldn't get anyone else to join me. And he said, sure. And he had a very lucrative practice, but he gave up this practice for three weeks to go city to city to city on his own dime and talk about that your vitamins you should be allowed to have and uh, you shouldn't have the FDA dictating it. Anyhow, so just to let you know that we can share some difference of opinion, but still also share a lot in common. So when it comes to vitamin D and vitamin D, uh, and calcium, we all know, all of us in the field know that the American diet is just overprocessed because when you eat something that's locally grown, it has more nutrition. It hasn't had a chance to oxidize. You're getting the full power of all the nutrients that are in that plant, whether it's blueberries or lettuce. When you purchase something even organically grown, let's say in another country like Mexico or Chile, and by the time you get it here, it might be 10 days before you actually get it. Well, that 10 day period is a long time for oxidative stress to occur in that plant. That's why it's always best to eat the foods locally grown and including sprouts because sprouts have the most nutrient dense impact for the smallest little vegetables imaginable. For example, sunflower sprouts are your most nutritious sprout and they have more vitamin C per weight than oranges. So get your vitamin D and get your calcium and help prevent all those fractures 
and the deaths that come from the infections that come from the fractures. And this was during a five-year follow-up of people who began to supplement with vitamin D and calcium. And by the way, don't try to get off by saying, well, I have some cheese, I have, I drink a glass of milk. No, because in order to be properly absorbed and utilized at the cellular level, calcium needs manganese, it needs uh, some phosphorus, it also needs vitamin D3, K, vitamin K, and all those together synergistically allows the calcium to get into your bones. That was why a healthy plant-based diet is better. Now, black walnuts, they're the best, they're the best tasting of all the nuts, but they only come once a year. And generally not from the United States. They're brought in, at least the ones I look on the package from England. But if you can get some black walnuts, freeze them. That way you can get, you know, 10, 20 pounds, enough to last you for a year. And just a handful of black walnuts. And guess what your University of Georgia found? That there's nutrients in the black walnuts that suppress the appetite and oxida oxidative degradation of lipids. In lay language, that means that you throw a handful of black walnuts in, in your salads or your smoothies or your hot cereal in the morning. According to this article published in the Journal of uh, Nutrition Research, you're going to get a lot of benefit. I mean, a lot of benefit. And that's because the newts are really high in nutrient density. And black walnuts have more protein than the more popular walnuts. Black walnuts also can improve satiety, S-A-T-I-E-T-Y. That means, and this was the whole basis of the Atkins diet, that when you eat something that's highly dense, let's say like a steak um, with fat, then you're going to be less likely to be hungry. Whereas if you eat a salad um, an hour later, you can be hungry because it digests faster. And then Atkins, his theory was that if you keep a person in a place of satiety, they're less likely to eat the unhealthy sugar-laden sweets as snacks. Now, I don't disagree with that. I believe that that's true. But then I was seeing Bob's patients because of all the problems they had being on that diet. And we discuss this all the time. It did not interfere with our friendship, which is another reason that you can have friends who have different points of view. And, and I'm seeing an intolerance of that today. Are you? If you are, call in. I'd like to hear your opinion about why can't we just get along? Why can't we have different points of view, but still be friends? Why can't we at least be civil and allow someone to have a freedom of speech, even if I disagree with what they're talking about? This morning, I was out uh, feeding the animals. I, I live and have for 26 years here, previously in Texas for eight years, and then upstate New York for 15 years on animal sanctuaries. And uh, I rescue animals, all types, exotics and not, get them give them love and a healthy diet, healthier than they'd ever get anywhere. And then when they're really healthy, then find them a loving home for life. And I've been able to do it for over 5,000 animals from giraffe and camels and all kinds, wildebeest, you name it, Scottish long-haired cattle. Well, many of you were at these places. You saw them for yourself. And you can see pictures of all these if you go up to garynall.com under photographs. Healing Springs Ranch, um, Fertiler Farm is some examples. In any case, yeah, I was thinking this morning that uh, I had a lot of friends at one time. I mean, a lot, because I was in a lot of different fields. And when you're in a lot of different fields, you meet people in those fields. And because I would do a lot of media, and I mean a lot of media, I was just thinking this morning, I had, I had 40 years, that's a whole career, lifetime in anything, of really good press. You know, I was featured in the New York Times Magazine section, Saving the Life of Harry Beale, who was 80 years old and had uh, emphysema in stage. And yet uh, three months, I had him down at the Healing Springs Ranch for three months. And I even remember the first day he got out there and he walked about five feet and he stopped, he couldn't breathe. I can't do this, Gary, I can't do this. 
I said, yes, you can. And I'll do it with you step by step. And yes, it will be painful. But each day it'll become less painful. And you walk a little further. And, and that's exactly what happened. By the time he left, he was able to walk six miles nonstop. And he no longer had emphysema. His end-stage emphysema, gone. Heart, heart disease, gone. High blood pressure, gone. So the New York Times did a feature on that. It was very nice. Then People Magazine did a big feature. Now, by the way, I don't know if you're aware of this. One of the shots they took was back in 1974-ish. And it was at a cover dish dinner. Do you remember those? Out on Long Island. And it was not in a restaurant because so many people came that there was no room in the restaurant. So they opened up the whole parking lot, of the shopping mall. And there were about 14 to 1600 people there. And uh, so a photographer and a person from People Magazine came just to see who my audience was. Lots of young people. I mean, lots of young people, 18, 19, 20 year olds, thousands of them in my audience. In any case, <clears throat> and the question is why, when the only other health program in America was uh, Carlton Fredrickson, all he had was white headed people, old people. That was it. There was nothing talking about exercise or meditation or yoga, none of that, just high protein diet. All right. I mean, he was very charismatic. Uh, he had a wicked sense of humor. He was a great debater. Uh, and he helped a lot of people to a degree. But there was nothing holistic. And I guess the young people, it was that time. It was like being in the right place at the right time uh, where suddenly people come together. And what was interesting is all the people coming together. And I was thinking about this this morning about how we had so many people wanting to come up to the Healing Springs Ranch to learn farming and conservation and ecology and gourmet vegan cooking, all these different things that no one ever talked about their politics. No one talked, I'm a conservative, I'm a Republican, I'm, I'm Jewish. I'm, my, I had a sign out front said, everyone's invited to sit at my table. That's how I've lived my life. And uh, I remember there was a woman named Claire. I'll bet many of you who came, thousands of you came. I'm guesstimating maybe 20,000 because on Sundays, people could come up for the day. They come up in the morning and leave at four in the afternoon. And we provide them with a free dinner and uh, at noon. And Claire saw that it wasn't working one way earlier. And by the way, she came as a guest, tall, red haired, bold red hair, natural, uh, Irish, vigorous, uh, smart. And uh, because she could see things need to be done, and she'd say, she was a guest, she'd say after the fourth time she was there, and everybody came back multiple times, like five times in the summer. She says, I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to help you with these retreats. I'm coming to staff. I'll run the staff. I said, fine. And the first thing she says, she's got a buddy of mine, Dr. Donald Mullen from the Albert Ellis Center. And they built 10, 12 foot long dinner tables. Why? Picnic tables. Because We didn't serve, get this, remember? We didn't serve three dishes, an entree, a soup, and a salad. You could pick from 20 to 40 entrees. Yeah, yeah. We had different chefs coming during the um, Fridays, making up these wonderful meals. And we had the French brick ovens making the scene breads. And we show people how to grind flour uh, and, and uh, from whole grains into flour. And how to make bread from scratch, how to make tofu from scratch. And then the kids could go out and learn animal husbandry, how to love animals, not raise them for meat. And you'd see all these kids sitting there and chickens in their laps, they're petting the chickens. And then the chickens just got very used to going over and getting groomed by the kids. And they just, all day were the kids, oh, they're over there, you have 20 kids, and they're all people who bring their family. It was just a wonderful occasion. And And all the buddies of mine, uh, we all built bunk beds up in the top of the barn because we wanted the guests to have. Uh, and these were not exclusive accommodations. It's not like the villa. Man. This, uh, these were rough because I decided to get this. I decided to live there with Howard and Steve, my brothers, as the people in the 1700s who built it did. So... All the tools we got, we looked all over New England and found tools. So if a window broke, we fixed it as they would have. We did. We used no modern tools for anything. But also, 
the uh, my female friends stayed in the house in the third floor, and that's where uh, all the guests stayed back then. And uh, and it was warm where we were it was not warm. Didn't need a lot of it. Some uh, summers upstate sometimes be a little chilly, but there we would be. We'd be laughing and having fun in our bunk beds. It's like it's like all these adults, very successful adults like Marty Feldman and Dr. Uh, Putterman and Dr. Lane Kahn. It's like going back to summer camp. We had a wonderful time and everybody had a wonderful time. And people learn. And uh, we had walnut trees and uh, we had uh, we had people who make fresh ice cream. Remember the ice cream? I'd be sitting there churning the ice, the old fashioned way. You know, you have a little a steel container and you put the, uh, uh, we'd put goat's milk in. And then this is before the nut milks existed. And then we put fresh walnuts. And if there were berries, and there always were berries or cherries, <clears throat> we'd put the berries in. And then there were beehives. And we'd put honey in there and churn that up, a little cinnamon. And we'd serve fresh ice cream. And there was a guy named Phil Hodis, Dr. Phil Hodis. And uh, I kept seeing Phil get back in line. So everybody had their ice cream. And Phil come by and says, get any more? I said, yeah. And one day he had six bowls of ice cream. <laughs> And I said, Phil, I think you've had enough. Six bowls. Five. These were big bowls. And my buddy, uh, Ron Milky, did the same thing, except Ron was sick the next day, laying there. Oh, I'm sick. W wonder why, Ron. He only had five bowls of ice cream. It was a lot of fun. And I'm sure it was for many of you. And we had pictures. But all the, and all these people, in fact, I didn't know because I asked everyone. My rule is always this. Never tell anyone what you do when you come to a retreat or any, any event I have. Why? Because subconsciously, you could be judging a person based upon where they're at in some artificial um, social order. Well, if you're a doctor, or if you're a lawyer, or you're a judge, uh, you're, a, you know, you're a priest, you're a nun, you're going to be possibly treated differently. I didn't want anyone judging you based upon your background or your social status. I wanted people to judge each other based upon the joy and love and openness and, and thoughtfulness and the stimulating discussions you could have in that moment. And I only found out later, uh, much later, that uh, that a couple that had volunteered for the entire 14 years that I had this place uh, were very well known in their field, very famous in their field. I didn't know it because <clears throat> it was not my field. Anyhow, it's off course, but it just means that whenever you can grow something locally, whenever you can support something that's local, do so. Because we raised a ton of produce. We start the very first um, food co-op in the East, High Foods Food Co-op, started that. And then uh, that was before the Berkeley one. We were ahead of them by six months. Anyhow, it was just a wonderful time. And I was just thinking of all the people back then who were friends, but they, they weren't necessarily friends of each other. They knew each other. They liked each other, but they had their own friendships. And then the lesson for me this morning on the track was... I just stopped and I thought, really appreciate the people in your life when they're in your life. I mean, show them that you love them, you care about them, and you're honored that they would allow you in their lives. Take nothing for granted. Because I'm thinking that was 50 years ago, 51 years ago. And many of them were in their 20s. Now they're in their 70s. What's happened to their life in between? Now, virtually, with the exception of Ron Milkey uh, and my brother, all the other people who are my friends back then have all passed, and uh, younger and older. And then at different times, you have different groups, and you come together and you share the camaraderie at that moment. And that's why I say life is made up of some remarkable moments. Cherish them. Keep those in your mind. It can also include very negative events. Surrender that because that interferes with the joy of the moment. Anyhow, just something that came to mind, wanted to share with you. So getting back to the black walnuts, this was a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial. And what they found is they gave people black walnuts to eat in their breakfast. And they found that these people had 
a substantial change in their lipid profiles. And, the, and that's important. If you can have healthier cholesterol, and that is a big, big, big plus for helping you with heart disease. Also from the Heidelberg University Institute of Psychology, another little aside, when I was over there studying anti-aging with a uh, Dr. Martin, Klaus Martin, at his clinic, um, <laughs> it was funny uh, because I also took a bunch of them out for dinner. It was their wedding anniversary. Uh, the, the Not Klaus, but Dr. Joseph Bissels and his wife. And, and Ron, my friend, we, he took us to a very famous restaurant. And it was to celebrate his wife's and his anniversary. And so Ron kept eating everything. I mean, everything on the menu. Oh, I'll sample that. And then Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Dissels would say, now they make the best of this, so oh, I'll try that. And I'm thinking, oh, goodness. So I just, about an hour in the meal, I, I say, I'll be back in a moment to go to the restroom. <clears throat> I went back and I said to the waiter, how much is the bill? So he had it up and he said, it's about uh, $400. You've had a lot of different items. I haven't had those items <laughs> Ron has. So I go back and I'm kind of nudging Ron under the table with my foot, stop ordering. But then comes the dessert menu. And uh, I finally reached across the table and I said, Ron, if you order anything else, I'm not flying you back to New York. You can walk back across the ocean, but it because, and I said it very quietly. <clears throat> Anyhow, it didn't, it didn't budge him. He ordered four different samples of dessert. So then the bill came and I'm thinking, I don't have enough money, but I told him I would pay for it. And I'm thinking, what the heck am I going to do? So I said, well, it was my treat and my pleasure to celebrate your anniversary with you. And this is the least I can do. So I go to get my wallet. I think I might have three hundred dollars, and 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 so just at that moment he pulls on the check. He's no, 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 no. This is our anniversary. No, you're here. You're our guest. I said, and I pull back. No, no, sir. It's just my way of saying thank you. So he pulled again, and I'm thinking, <laughs> if I pull again, he's going <laughs> to let me keep it. So I just I let him pull it back and said, well, okay, thanks. But I'll tell you this, Ron and I had a little come to Jesus conversation about me ever taking him out to eat. And I said, Ron, what human being could put that many different types of food in their body? Well, it was, it was good. It was good. Yeah. Yeah. Little side bar thing that came up. Anyhow, I also visited the University of Heidelberg on that trip. Why? Because in the United States, before I left, I asked the FDA, how many studies do you have supporting magnets helping in the healing process. And they said, none, there are no magnetic studies. And I said, that's not true. They said, no, we have them all. They're none. So at the University of Heidelberg alone, I found 500. So I photocopied all 500. That's just one institute. In Russia, they had thousands. And I took those back and I sent them back to the same person. And I wrote a book after that, Healing with Magnets. It just shows you how far behind we were in the sciences that don't provide a profit at the end, something you can't patent. Magnets were great, especially for putting it at your base of your head so it helps with depression. Anyhow, um, it was a wonderful trip. And, uh, but they're saying that the human brain, they meaning the Heidelberg University Institute of Psychology says that the human brain doesn't slow down until all after 60. Okay, was well, that the average person brain? Because I'll tell you some of the people whose brain doesn't close down. John Williams, the great composer, probably our greatest composer, and the, certainly the most prolific in American history, right up there with Gershwin and, uh, and other greats. In any case, um, so just think of it this way. What if you work with the brain every day to get it to become more active? A hobby, reading um, you know, in a foreign la language, learn a foreign language. Very easy to do that now because they have all these apps that help with that. 
uh, creating something yourself, inventing something, writing something, learning a new, learning a new way of learning. This all stimulates the brain so it doesn't start to shut down on you. So the more creative you are, the more engaging you are, the longer your brain is going to live. All right? Simple things. Also, finally, the exercise, once again, this study, the study at the University of Pittsburgh shows that the more you exercise as an older adult, meaning over the age of 60, you're going to retain your memories better. Now, we all know, and especially listening to this program, that exercise is great for you, but that still leaves plenty of questions. How much exercise? I say an hour a day, six days a week. Who benefits most? You do, because you're helping your endorphins so you can calm yourself out from any stressful events you've been over-focused on so that you get this natural, what we call runner's high, those are the endorphins. And win our lives. Start early and go to the end of your life. But the new research shows that it seems that exercising about three times a week for at least four months is how much you need to reap the benefits of episodic memory. So you can really begin to recover those memories. Just saying, the more you do with exercise, the lower your heartbeat, that's good. And the lower your blood pressure, that's great. All right. And by the way, for those of you who have gallstones, University of Kiel, K-E-I-E-L in Germany, says eat more foods with vitamin E. I suggest you just take vitamin E. So every day, 400 to 800 units if you have gallstones. We've got a lot more coming at you, but we're going to take a break. And when we come back, 